time to be in the house of the Lord. I love church. I can't believe I'm saying that. I remember a day when I just, that was the last thing I wanted to say. Now I can't imagine not going to church. It seems like your, your, your whole week, your whole, that day is, is all out of whack if you're not in the house of the Lord. Um, Johnny's ending prayer is kind of uh, prophetic as far as a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight as we uh, finish chapter 22. So with that said, would you guys join me in prayer, please? Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord. How great you are. Awesome and mighty and wonderful, and we can go on and on and on, Lord. There's, not, there's no earthly words to describe the awesomeness of our God. And to think that one day, Lord, we will see you face to face. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you, Lord, for the new life that we enjoy in you. Father, we just ask that tonight as we dig into your word, Father, that you would you would be amongst us, Lord. Give us wisdom and understanding. Help me, Lord, to bring forth your word in such a way, Lord, that it's understandable and it is received. Lord, whatever thoughts and cares and worries of the world that we have right now, Lord, I pray that we just let them go for this, for this time and just focus on you. Bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. As we continue our study of the testing of Abraham, the father of faith. As I said last week, this was not so much a test to produce faith in Abraham as it was to test, a test to reveal the faith of Abraham. Now, needless to say, the Bible says a great deal about faith. The word faith appears 336 times in the King James Bible. Other Bible versions have our varying counts, uh, varying counts of, of the word faith appear in different versions of the Bible. In the NIV Bible, it's 389. In the New King James Version, 378. And in the New American Standard, the word appears 500, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 521 times. God was testing Abraham to see how far his faith would take him. Would he trust God and do exactly what he told him to do? Would he take the knife to Isaac in complete obedience to God, or would he falter at the last moment? Now, up to this point, the Lord has been molding and making Abraham into the man that he wants him to be. God has been building his faith, and now he has come to the most severe test of all. But just think about all that Abraham has gone through. God tells him to leave his homeland to be a stranger in the land of Canaan. Immediately after that, he arrives in the promised land, and he encounters a famine. The Egyptians capture his, his wife, Sarah, and brings her to Pharaoh. Abraham faces incredible odds in the battle of the four and five kings. He marries Hagar after not being able to conceive a child with Sarah. God tells him to circumcise himself and all the male members of his household. And remember, Abraham was late in life. He was an elderly man. The king of Gerah captured Sarah, intending to take her for himself. God tells him to send Hagar and Ishmael, his son whom he loved, to send them away. He pleads for the life of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, ten righteous people to be exact, only to see the entire cities destroyed. And now this, the sacrifice of his dear son, Isaac. What will Abraham do? We ended last week with Isaac tied and laying on the altar. All is ready now. All is set for Abraham. What will be his next move? Verse 10. Abraham stretched out his hands 
and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that, you're, that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the moment of the Lord, it will be provided. So we must believe Abraham was completely willing to plunge the knife into Isaac because his faith was in God's ability to raise, God's ability to raise him from the dead, not in God's desire to stop the sacrifice. Abraham didn't think that this was a drama or a mere ceremony. He didn't think that God was just going through the motions. Abraham acted in a manner consistent with his knowledge of God. That is, he trusted him, concluding that whatever God's purpose may or may not have been in this situation, God had at least shown that he could not be his enemy. God was his friend. Abraham left the difficulty with God, which is the essence of true faith. What is faith? Faith is believing God and acting upon it. This is what Abraham did. God had shown that he could be trusted. So Abraham believed God and acted, even though he could not understand the solution to the difficulty. Verses 10 and 11 detail what is about to take place are told in such a way that it seems like slow motion so the reader can experience with the father the anguish of the prolonged moment. I mean, again, read verses 10 and 11 again, and it's almost like it's going in slow motion. He raises his hand and lays back to plunge his, the knife into his son. Just as Abraham was to plunge the knife into Isaac, the angel of the Lord stopped him. Boyce writes, quote, God did provide a resurrection, figuratively speaking, but it was not until the last minute and not before Abraham had demonstrated his total willingness to offer up his son, end quote. Spurgeon writes, quote, notice the obedience of this friend of God it was no playing at giving up his son. He was really doing it. It was no talking about what he could do and would do, perhaps, but his faith was practical and heroic, end quote. David Guzik writes, one may say, it is not fair or right for God to, who, to tell Abraham to do something and then Tell him not to do it. If God really wanted to test Abraham, he should have made him plunge the knife into his son's chest. Yet, often God takes the will of the deed with his people. When he finds them truly willing to make the sacrifice that he demands, he often does not require it. This is how we can be martyrs without ever dying for Jesus. We live the life of a martyr right now, end quote. By the way, I'll be quoting a lot of, uh, doing a lot of quotes tonight because some of these guys say it in such a great way and just about everybody has something to say about this particular portion of scripture. Barnhouse writes, quote, but often there are believers who wonder how they may know the will of God. Have you ever wondered that? How do I know what God wants from me? We believe that 90% of the knowing of the will of God consists in willingness to do it before it is known, end quote. In other words, are you willing? Is your, do you have a willing heart to do what God tells you to do before you even really know what he wants you to do? My life is yours, Lord. I'm surrendered to you. You call the shots. 
the repeating of Abraham's name denotes the haste, the, the haste to prevent the slaughter of his son, which was just to the point of happening, and in which Abraham was not slow in doing, but ready to do quickly. God said it, and Abraham said it was nothing but to obey and could go forward with it and not delay. Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, it said. With this, God emphatically showed Abraham that he was not like the pagan gods, um, pagans, gods worshipped by the Canaanites and other gods that were said to demand human sacrifice, that he wasn't like them, that he didn't need that to please him. God strongly and clearly demonstrated that he did not want human sacrifice. Abraham displayed his heart towards God in that he was willing to give up his only son. God displays his heart towards us in the same way by giving his, his only begotten son. When God asked Abraham for the ultimate demonstration of love and commitment, he asked for Abraham's son. When God, the father, wanted to show us the ultimate demonstration of his love and commitment to us, he gave us his son. We can say to the Lord, now I know that you love me, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Think about that. That applies to each and every one of us. Here was proof of how much a mere man would do for the love of God. Boyce makes this observation. Abraham was only asked to sacrifice his son. He didn't actually have to do it. Even if he had, there was, this, this was only a physical death involved. But when the time came for God, the heavenly father, to sacrifice his son, it was not a mere physical death. It was a spiritual death, one that achieved redemption for sinners. When God's hand was raised at Calvary, there was no one to call out, stay your hand, do not harm the boy. When God offered up his sacrifice, the hand that was poised above Christ fell. Jesus died. Johnny just talked about that. Through that death, God brought life to all who trust in Christ's sacrifice. Hallelujah, end quote. One commentator writes, quote, the angels explain now, I know, is an admission that the ordeal was a test, a discovery of Abraham's depth of loyalty. Fear God, describes the man's obedience and trust motivated by his love of God. This reminds us of what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Because you have not withheld him from me presents the test evidence of the patriarch's devotion. Abraham's faith was made complete by what he did, end quote. Let's move on. Verse 13. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. All the while, God still required a sacrifice. God didn't call off the sacrifice. Instead, he required that there be a substitute provided by God himself. The idea of substitution atonement is introduced, which would find its fulfillment in the death of Christ Jesus. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says this, Surely he has bore our grief and carried our sorrow, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten, uh, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we, were healed. we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. 
We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This was all done on our behalf. Jesus took what was meant for you and me. John chapter 1 verse 29 says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Second Chronicles chapter 5 verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We should have suffered and died on that cross. But Jesus, God's son, took our place. God has always provided a substitute. One commentator made this observation, quote, now, why was a ram offered as a sacrifice here instead of a lamb? I believe that God is showing us that the promise will not be fully fulfilled until Jesus, the true lamb of God, fulfills it, end quote. Abraham called the name of that place. The naming of the place was significant. Abraham called it, the Lord will provide. What does that mean? Jehovah Jireh, right? We all know that. In this mount, it shall be provided. Abraham didn't name the place in reference to what he experienced. He didn't name it Mount Trial or Mount Agony or Mount Obedience. Instead, he named the hill in reference to what God did. He named it Mount Provision. He named it knowing God would provide the ultimate sacrifice for salvation on, all that, on, on that hill at a future date. Spurgeon wrote again, quote, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah will see it, or Jehovah will provide, or Jehovah will be seen. We offer a variety of interpretations, but the exact idea is that of seeing and being seen. For God to see is to provide. Our own word, provide, is only Latin for to see. You know how we say that we will see to a matter? Possibly this expression hits the nail on the head. Our Heavenly Father sees our needs and with divine foresight of love, prepares the supply. He sees to a need to supply it, and in the seeing, he is seen. In the providing, he manifests himself, end quote. Yes. He goes on to say, as it is said to this day. So apparently, Moses, apparently Moses met, even in his own day, men looked at that hill and said, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Again, Spurgeon wrote, Abraham and later Moses recognized that God did provide, and it pointed to the ultimate sacrifice when God would provide himself. God provided a ram instead of Isaac. This was sufficient for the occasion as a type, but that which was typified by the ram is, in, is infinitely more glorious. In order to save us, God provided God. Did you catch that? I cannot put it more simply. He did not provide an angel nor a mere man, but God himself, end quote. Boyce writes, quote, the, name of God are wind the names of God are windows through which his character is seen. The name tells us that he is the most high God possessor of heaven and earth, El Elyon, the, might, the almighty God, El Shaddai, the eternal unchanging God, El Olam, the Lord, Adonai, the God who is there, Jehovah Shammah, and more. Since the name of God declares his attributes, we are not surprised that the unparalleled revelation of God's wisdom and grace in Abraham's near sacrifice of his son, brings with it another of God's name, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. 
end quote. In Abraham's day, God provided a ram for a sacrifice in place of Abraham's son. But what Abraham really learned was that at the proper time, God will provide his own son to die for our salvation. When Isaac asked Abraham where the lamb was for the burnt offering, Abraham replied, God himself will see to it. He was declaring that God had all things under his control and would provide what was needed at the right time. When Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh, he was not merely thinking of his own past experience. He was also reflecting on the fact that it is God's abiding character that prompts him to see to our problems and that at his appointed times, he would undoubtedly provide for the great problems of sin. God would provide a savior. David Guzik makes this observation, quote, this event is also a prophecy of Jesus rising from the dead on the third day, as we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, which says, he rose again the third day according to the scripture. This is one place where the Old Testament indicates the Messiah would rise again the third day. It says, it says through the picture of Isaac, Isaac was reckoned dead. By Abraham, as soon as God gave the command and Isaac was made alive, risen three days later. Remember the three days? The three days from the time God gave the command for him to travel to Mount Moriah? Isaac's life is a picture of Jesus because it becomes even clearer. For instance, both were loved by their fathers. Both offered themselves willingly. Both carried wood up the hill to their sacrifice. Both were sacrificed on the same hill. Both were delivered from death on the third day. On this very mountain, the Lord provided a sacrifice for Abraham, and he will provide himself as a sacrifice some 2,000 years later, end quote. One commentator writes, quote, what God eventually gave his son for us, it was on the very mountain where Abraham had offered his sacrifice, we know this from 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, which identifies Jerusalem with Mount Moriah. Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. In Abraham's day, there was no temple on this mountain. In fact, there was not even a city. It was a deserted, barren place. But the fact that this was the place God intended to build his city and in which he intended to have his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, die, explains why he had Abraham make the three-day journey to get there. God was showing that it was on this mountain, Jerusalem or Mount Moriah, that he would see to our salvation. End quote. Wow. Boyce writes, quote, when all these factors are put together, the account is wonderful. Amen to that. Remember how Isaac asked, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? That was a good question. One the human race may well have asked again and again through the ages of the Old Testament history leading up to the time of Jesus Christ. God commanded the animal sacrifice so that people would learn the principle of substitution but it must have been evident to many who thought about it deeply that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Sacrifices were a shadow of things to come, but they were not the real lamb, end quote. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples when Jesus walked by. Jesus said, look, the lamb of God. Earlier, he had testified, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. God's Lamb, the Lamb of God. This is the Lamb Abraham had said God would provide, that he would provide himself, the Lamb. Verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, 
declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seeds as the stars of the heavens and the sands which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to the young men when they arose, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived in Beersheba. In addition to God's intervention to prevent Abraham's sacrifice of his son, there was the confirmation of God's promise to Abraham through his son. This would seem to be the voice of God himself, the, u- the unique messenger or angel of the Lord. The message following seems to be in the first person. By myself, I have sworn. Jesus, the Messiah, God's the son, was uniquely present at this remarkable event. Think about that. Jesus was watching from his place in heaven all that was taking place with Abraham and Isaac, knowing that this was a foreshadowing of what was to happen to him centuries later. There is always an afterwards to the test of life because God never wastes suffering. God knows, that, knows what he is doing and why. At the end of the day, we often find that though we don't understand, he is working it out for our betterment. Let's face it, we don't always understand the ways of God, but the Bible declares that, his ways. Job chapter 23, verse 10 says this, but he knows the way that I take when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Isaiah 55, verse 8 says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my way, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a principal fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Abraham received several blessings from God because of his obedience and faith. Abraham had described this whole difficult experience as worship back in verse 5. Because to him, that's what it was. He obeyed God's will and sought to please God's heart, and God commended him. It is worth it to go through trials if at the end the Father can say to us, well done. And we would gladly go through as many trials as he put it before us if we heard those words. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Abraham knew the blessings that come to those who trust God's promise and trust it so completely that they will take action on that behalf. Trusting in God's power to raise his only son from the dead, Abraham received great blessings. God gave Abraham the gift of a son. And Abraham was willing to give him back to the Lord. Ray Stedman writes, quote, even when even God's gifts to us are of no value until we are willing, if necessary, to lose them so that God might reign without a rival in our hearts. When we have to come to the place to which the spirit of God wants to bring us, that perfect relationship with the father in which our Lord lived his entire life, when God means more to us than anything, to, than anything, when we love the Lord our God with all of our strength and soul and mind and spirit and heart, and we are even willing to give up the very gift that God has given, then in resurrection power, that gift will be a blessing to everyone it touches. End quote. It goes on to say, I will multiply your descendants. Abraham's obedience was based on truth in God's promise to bring descendants through Isaac. Therefore, God repeated and emphasized that promise after Abraham's remarkable obedience. As the stars of the heavens, as the sands of the sea, uh, in both of them, you have an innumerable multitude. And that's the idea. 
It's just numberless that are going to come from you. You won't be able to number them or count them. God added to the already vast blessings promise. Abraham's seed would possess the gates of his enemies. This means that his descendants would occupy the place of authority over those who would oppress them. The capture of the city gates meant the fall of the city itself. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 says this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ, the Messiah, the only Son of God, will fulfill this promise of blessing to all the nations of the earth. One commentator wrote, quote, that is in his one and principal seed, the Messiah that should spring from him and whom all the elect of God of all nations under the heavens are blessed with all spiritual blessings, peace, pardon, righteousness, eternal life with grace here and glory hereafter, end quote. The ministering spirit of the Lord himself spoke to Abraham and the Lord swore by himself because there was no greater he reiterated the blessings again on Abraham. Abraham has passed the test. All believers throughout the ages will be blessed because of the faithfulness of Abraham. Hudson Taylor used to hang in his home a plaque with two words on it, Ebenezer and Jehovah Jireh. They mean, hitherto hath the Lord helped us and the Lord will see to it. Whether he looked back or ahead, Hudson Taylor knew the Lord was at work and he had nothing to fear. But to God, we can live that way. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called his name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. From this point on, Abraham's task was to prepare for receiving future blessings through Isaac. Now, this next section just sort of throws me for a loop because it seems so out of place here. Why do we have this genealogy of Nahor's family sort of stuck right here at the end? Now, it came about, verse 20, now it came about after these things, that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kimuel, the father of Aram, Chizit, and Hazal, and Phildash, and Jedlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel became, come, became the father of Re Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Remyo, also bore Teba and Gaham, Tehash, and Mecca. So reports came from the east that the family of Nahor, Abraham's brother, was expanding. So I'm assuming this was added because among those born was Rebekah, the future wife of Isaac. She was the daughter of Bethuel the youngest of Nahor's eight sons by Milcah. This record is included here, even though one would expect it to be closer to chapter 24, but it serves as a tie-in with chapter 23, which we will, Lord willing, be in next week, which records Sarah's death and burial. In burying Sarah, Abraham ignored his ancient ancestry, not going back to Padamaram for her burial. This is the first mention of a concubine in the Bible. In addition to his wife, Milcah, Nahor also took a concubine, took a concubine. Matthew Poole gave an explanation of a concubine. A concubine was an inferior kind of wife. 
That sort of throws me for a loop. What is an inferior type of wife? Was an inferior, uh, an inferior kind of wife taken according to the common practice of those times, subject to the authority of the principal wife, whose children had no rights of inheritance, but were endowed with gifts. This taking of an additional wife or concubine was recognized as illegal and was, was legal and was culturally accepted in ancient world, including the world Abraham and the patriarchs lived in. However, it was never in God's plan we know this because of the pattern God give, gave that we've studied, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And speaking upon the Genesis 2, 24 principle, Jesus clearly told us that this was God's intention at the beginning. Now, God never gave a specific command against polygamy until the New Testament, but God showed in principle that it was never his heart. In addition, whenever we see the family life of a polygamous household in the Bible, those families are marked by chaos and conflict. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to catch, take care of one wife is enough. Man, and be married to Cindy and try to, man, two Cindys? Oh, my. But I added this, I added this, this little bit of information because of the times we're living in, the confusion over God's ordained ordinance concerning marriage. It doesn't say in there two women or two men. It says a man and a woman. Guys, I want to close. And let me also say next week, and I'm praying about it, we may take a little detour before we go to chapter 23. We'll see where the Lord takes me. But I want to close tonight with something that I, 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 I saw, I read from Spurgeon. Ben sent me a, a teaching from Spurgeon a couple, uh, last week, I think it was. And if, by the way, if you don't have Spurgeon's day and evening um, devotional, you should get it. It's worth the investment. But I'm hoping that this, what I read, will encourage you and strengthen you in your faith and in your walk and just encourage you, encourage you in your day-to-day -day life. Spurgeon writes, quote, I believe that the truth contained in the expression Jehovah Jireh was ruling Abraham's thoughts long before he uttered it and appointed it to be the memorial name of the place where the Lord had provided a substitute for Isaac. It was this thought, I think, which enabled him to act as promptly as he did under the trying circumstances. His reason whispered within him, if you slay your son, how can God keep his promise to you that your seed shall be as many as the stars of heaven? He answered that suggestion by saying to himself, Jehovah will see to it. As he went upon that painful journey with his dearly beloved son at his side, the suggestion may have come to him. How will you meet Sarah when you return home, having stained your hands in the blood of your, her son? How will you meet your neighbors when they hear that Abraham, who, fest, who professed to be such a holy man, has killed his son? That answer still sustained his heart. Jehovah will see to it. Jehovah will see to it. He will not fail in his word. Perhaps he will raise my son from the dead. But in some way or other, he will justify my obedience to him and vindicate his own command. Jehovah will see to it. This was a quietness to every mistrustful thought. I pray that we may drink into this truth and be refreshed by it if we follow the Lord's bidding. He will see to it that we shall not be ashamed or confounded. If we come into great need by following his command, he will see to it that the loss shall be recompensed. If our difficulty multiply and increase so that our way seems completely blocked up, Jehovah will see to it that the road shall be cleared. The Lord will see us through in the way of holiness if we are only willing to be thorough 
in it and dare to follow whatsoever he leads the way. We need not wonder that Abraham should utter this truth and attach it to the spot which was to be forever famous, for his whole heart was saturated with it and it had been, and it had been sustained by it. Wisely he makes an altar and a, and, and a mountain to be, memorial, memorial, to be a memorial of the truth which had so greatly helped him. His trial had taught him more of God had, in fact, given him a new name for his God. And this he would not have forgotten, but he would keep it before the minds of the generations following, following by naming the place Jehovah Jireh. There is a rendering given to my text which we cannot quite pass over. Some read it that in the moment that people shall be seen in that mount in years to come, the multitude would gather to worship God. God's presence was in the temple, which was built upon that spot. And there the tribes went up, the tribes of the Lord, to worship the Most High. I dwell in a house not made with hands, but piled by God's God of solid slabs of mercy. He is, <clears throat> excuse me, he is building me a place of crystal, pure and shining, transparent as the day. I see the house in which I am to abide forever, gradually growing around me. Its foundation was laid of old, eternal love. In the mount it shall be seen. The Lord provided for me a covenant head, a redeemer, and a friend. In him I will abide. Since then, course upon course of the precious stone of loving kindness has been laid, and the jewel walls are all around me. Has it not been so with you? By and by we shall be roofed in with glory everlasting. Then as we shall look to the foundation and the walls and to the arch above our heads, we shall shout, Jehovah Jireh, God has provided all this for me. How shall we rejoice in every stone of the divine building? How shall our memory think over the method of the building? On such a day was that stone laid, I remember it right well. I was, so, I was sore sick, and the Lord comforted me. On such a day was that other stone laid. I was in prison spiritually, and the heavenly visitor came to me. On such another day was the bejeweled course completed, for my heart was glad in the Lord, and my glory rejoiced in the God of my salvation. I'm almost done. The walls of love are still rising, and when the building is finished and the top stone is brought out with shouts of grace, grace unto it, we shall then sing the song unto the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord has provided it. From the beginning to the end, there is nothing of man, nothing of merit, nothing of self, but all of God in Christ Jesus, who hath loved us with an everlasting love, and therefore hath abounded towards us in blessings according to the fullness of his infinite heart. To him be praise, world without end. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. One day we will hear those faithful words. Enter in, thy good and faithful servant. Don't you long for that day? Don't fear death. God is coming. The Lord will return. And we're going to see Jesus face to face. And we are going to hear those faithful words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. I love being saved. I want to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Father God, thank you. We praise and honor and glorify you for you are worthy of our praise and adoration. There is no God like you. Look at what you've done and continue to do in our lives. Some of us you have brought from the very doorsteps of the pit of hell, Lord. We were right there, and you lifted up, us up out of our muck and mire and cleaned us off, Lord. And all we can say, Lord, is thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray you would bless my family. 
Keep them safe. See them safely home. Let no hurt, harm, or danger come unto them. Until we come together again, we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.